Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We are continuing our time in the book of Genesis, and we're, we're talking about new beginnings, some new beginnings that happen through these stories. You see, these, these stories, they're not just impactful for the people who went through them or, or for the generation that directly followed them, but they also impact our lives as well, even today. You see, through these stories, we are reminded that God is faithful, that, that he keeps his promises, that in spite of the fact that, that we are often not faithful, that even though we don't always believe and trust and, and we have doubts and questions and all sorts of issues, still, nevertheless, God is faithful to us. And he keeps his word. He keeps his promises no matter what. You know, before we circle back to the story of Abraham and Isaac, I, I want to share with you a little bit about an article that I read uh, recently. It was an article about the things that dads uniquely share and teach their children. And this, this article especially keyed on, on some of the things that dad teach to their sons. And so today I want to share with you something that my dad taught me. I'm going to embarrass him since he's sitting over there. That's okay. <laughs> You know, when I was growing up, my dad enjoyed fishing. And there were a few times that he would come home and he'd, he'd show us the fish that he'd caught. And not only did he show us the fish he caught, but he also had the tale of the, the fish that got away, right? That sounded like a whale. But I thought it was cool. And so at about six years old, I asked to learn to fish, and my dad agreed. And he took me fishing. I had my little pole, and. And we went to a friend's pond and they threw some fish food in and we watched all the fish come to the surface. And, and my dad helped me the first few times, but one of the things I learned that day were the rules of being a fisherman. And the first rule of being a fisherman was that a fisherman baits his own hook. My dad showed me how the first few times, but it wasn't long and then this little tin of night crawlers was passed my way. Here you go, right? And you never know how crawly a worm can be until you're six years old and, and trying to get it on this little hook, right? And I'm sure it moved and wiggled. I, I'm sure I stabbed myself a time or two, but eventually you get the worm on the hook. My dad taught me how to cast it out. I'm sure he enjoyed untangling my line a few times that day. But eventually, as we were sitting on the dock watching the little bobber went under the water, and now my dad told me that when that happens, you, you lift the pole a little bit and you give it a little tug and, and, and then you reel in the fish. And so I brought this fish in and it's dangling there on the end of the line and I quickly learned rule number two to being a fisherman. A fisherman takes the fish off the hook. Now my dad was kind enough to teach me about spines and gills and, and fins and all that stuff. And once again, I'm sure I got poked uh, by a spine a time or two that day. But in general, you start at the head, you slide your hand over the back of the fish, you grab it, and you pop the hook out of its mouth. It's pretty simple. And I was pretty proud of myself that day. I had learned a whole bunch of things. I had become a fisherman. And I can remember we took a, a few fish home that day to show my mom, and then came the last part. Rule number three to being a fisherman a fisherman cleans his own fish. And that day I learned how to chop and dice and slice a fish. And by the end of it, I'm pretty sure that we had enough for a, a dip, maybe a cracker or two with a little dip on it, right? <coughs> but I was a fisherman. I had learned how to bait my own hook. I had learned to, to take the fish off the hook. I had learned to clean fish. Now, if you think of leadership in this way, if you think about leadership in the terms of, of impact and influence, my dad had been a leader for me. He had been exercising good judgment as a leader to help me to learn and understand the rules of fishing, to help me sort of enter into the guy's club of, of being a fisherman. And if you think about leadership in a moment like that, there's a, a wonderful definition of leadership from a book written by Cousy and Posner called The Leadership Challenge. And in it, here's what they say. They say the first function of leadership 
is model the way. Now here's the reason why I shared the story with you about learning how to fish. To model the way, you don't just tell someone about what you do. And in fact, you don't just tell them what you do or show them what you do. If you're gonna model the way, you tell them, you show them, and then you involve them in what you do. And the result for a six-year-old like me was that I learned how to fish. We're focusing on the story of Abraham and Isaac. By this time, Isaac has grown up, and once again, Abraham has this uh, trial of faith. There's a, a God moment, a God incident that happens far away from their home when it, where an altar is being built because they are about to make a sacrifice to God. And today we're going to talk about it in three parts, the test, the talk, and the thorns. You know, two weeks ago, if you were with us, we talked about a man by the name of Abram and God's covenant, his promises to Abram. God had called Abram to leave his homeland, to go to a place that he had never seen, to move his entire household and settle in this place that God was going to give to him. And God had made some, some absolutely incredible promises to Abraham. God had promised that he would make Abram into a great nation, that he would bless him, that all the families of the earth would be blessed through him. And so Abram picks up everything he owns, along with his nephew Lot, and they move to the land that God would show them. But there's a problem. While God had made a promise to Abraham to make him into a great nation, Abram and his wife Sarai, they didn't have any children of their own and they were growing older, by this time well past the years of childbearing. And so how could this be? How would God bless him? How would God turn Abraham into a great nation when he himself didn't have any children? How would God bless all the families of the earth through him when his family, Abram's family, is incomplete? And Abram struggled to believe in the promises of God. But God would again promise Abram a son. He told Abram, go out, look into the night skies, count the stars if you can count that high. That's how many descendants you are going to have. He made a covenant with Abram and renamed him Abraham, the father of many nations. God renamed Sarai, Sarah. And at the age of 100, Abraham and Sarah had a boy by the name of Isaac. He's the first, the, the child of Abraham and Sarah, Sarah that would turn into an ocean of, of genealogy and nations. Isaac is the promised son. Abraham had been told that Isaac would be the one, that he would be the, the gateway descendants of all the people who would be born into his family, who would make Abraham the father of many nations. But now as we get into chapter 22, many years have gone by. And God comes to Abraham and says, Genesis chapter 22, verse 2, God says, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Talk about a test. You know, as a 21st century person, I've been blessed to grow up to live here in Wisconsin most of my life. I've had the privilege to learn and grow under some great pastors and leaders. I've gotten the opportunity to learn a whole lot of things from a whole lot of people over the course of my life. But as I read this verse, it strikes me as highly irrational. And in fact, highly unacceptable. Like, can you imagine this? Take your son, and not just your son, but your one and only son, and offer him as a sacrifice. What a test. But I think if we can step back and step out of our 21st century way of thinking and into the ancient world, into the Hebrew way of thinking, the story really takes on new meaning. You see, all throughout the Old Testament and through the Hebrew story, all through the first five books of the Bible, God states repeatedly over and over again that the firstborn of both man and animal, that the firstborn belongs to him. 
And so when God comes to Abraham and and says to him, take your firstborn, your son Isaac, he will be the one you will offer to me. What seems ludicrous, what seems irrational to me was simply the heart of a father, a dad, torn in two directions, one towards his son whom he loves and one towards his God whom he loves. And I can imagine the conversation that Abraham has to have with Isaac. Isaac, we are, we're going to make a trip. We're going to make a, a sacrifice. We're going to make an offering for the forgiveness of sins. You and I, we are going to go. We're going to make this trip together. And they gather up the wood, and they gather up the coals for the fire. And Abraham and Isaac, they set out on this journey with two of their servants. And finally, after traveling for three days, Abraham and Isaac, they leave behind the servants. And I imagine that Abraham didn't sleep very well. I imagine he probably didn't eat much as he's torn, pulled in two directions, as he has this incredible test of faith, torn between his son, the son that he loves, and his God, offering up his son as a sacrifice for the God whom he loves. You know, people who who talk about sacrifice from an Old Testament perspective They often talk about it as something that you are to do and you are to offer to God something that is your one and only. And as I thought about that, you know, we may give to church, we may support and give financially to an organization that we love or care for, we may help schools or or other institutions that we are a part of and enjoy, but in all my years, and I have heard organizations, churches, groups asking for donation and support, I have heard lots of talks about sacrificial giving. But as I think back, I have never heard of any group, any organization, any church ask for someone's one and only. And that's exactly what's happening here. Now think about that for a moment. What are your things that are are so prized that they could not be replaced? What are the things that you have that are your one and only? And only. This is what Abraham hears from his God. To give up his his one and only son. To offer him as a sacrifice to God. It was a test. And Abraham was quick to respond. He began to move toward that mountain. And when I think about the stress and anxiety that Abraham must have had as he, as he thought about offering up his one and only son, uh, the words stress test kept coming back to me. How, how many of you have had a stress test done before? All right, there's a number of hands, right? A stress test. The doctor has you walk on a treadmill, and it's, it's nice and easy for the first minute or so, right? And then what happens? They pick up the speed. Pick up the incline, right? And before you know it, you're sweating uh, profusely, right? You're trying to catch your breath and you keep going, right? The doctor keeps yelling, 30 seconds, 30 seconds. Why take a stress test? Why does the doctor make you go through that? Well, it's to reveal the condition of your heart. You go through a stress test to understand the capacity, to understand the health of your heart. You know, the book of James talks a whole bunch about testing, and he has some instruction. James chapter 1, verse 2. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. When we go through seasons of testing, the result is we stay connected to the source of our faith, our life, our health. The result is is that our faith is deepened. There's greater clarity of our relationship and our dependence on God, our trust in God. It grows. We need to keep that in mind as we go through challenges, and difficulties. And in fact, I need to keep that in mind as we go through this vacancy. As we look for another pastor, these words are good for, they're a good reminder for both me and you as we deal with the changes that are taking place. 
as the days turn to weeks, as the weeks turn to the months of head, as we search for and look for the right pastor to come and join the ministry that God is doing here at St. Paul. These words are good for us. And it's good to remember that it's good to go through times of testing because it reveals the clarity, it reveals the condition of our hearts. Sacrifice your son, your only, your one and only son. I think about that walk and I think about that test and, and I can't help but think about dads. What God is doing through Abraham is have a dad tell his sh son, show his son, and then involve his son in something that he will never, ever forget. And they journey up this mountain after three days, and along the way, as they're going up the mountain, the, a question pops up. Isaac asks his dad, he says, behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham says, God will provide for himself the lamb. God knows us. He knows the things that we need. He has provided in the past. Abraham couldn't have children, and yet God promised that he would be the father of many nations. And after some time, God provides. He keeps his word. You know, I can look back at my own life, and I can see God's provision. When I was a new pastor, I went to two small churches in rural South Texas. Couldn't afford much, but they did what they could to provide for both me and my family. But there was a vacancy pastor that had served them before I got there, and it just so happened to be that he had inherited a large trust from a, a member of a former congregation that he had served, and this member loved to support ministry. And so he told this pastor, I'm leaving you this money. Do that. Support ministry. Give it away. I, I got to meet this pastor at my installation, and we were in Texas for about a month, and we were trying to figure out how we were going to make ends meet, right? Trying to, to look at what we had going, coming in and what we had going out. And, and let me tell you, the numbers didn't add up. I didn't know what we were going to do. How are we going to make this work? Here I am. And this pastor called me and he told me about his friend. He told me that he had been given money to support ministry and that from then on out for every month, every month we would receive a check in the mail for $350. And let me tell you, sometimes that was the difference from being able to pay our bills or not. It made the difference. But what about you? Can you look at your life? Can you reflect back and see God's provision? How he loves and cares for and provides for you? Can you see a point in your life where, where you didn't know how things were gonna turn out, where you didn't know how to make things work, you didn't know what was gonna happen next, but now you look back on it and you can see God's love and his care and his provision for you. You know, Abraham is doing the same thing, but instead of reflecting and looking back, that really he's right in the middle of things. There really is no answer. Isaac keeps asking, where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham and Isaac, they're up on the mountain. They're getting ready to make the sacrifice. Everything they need is there. There's fire, there's wood that's been turned into an altar, but there is no lamb. And I imagine Abraham just keeps saying, God will provide, God has got this, God will take care of us. You don't have to worry because God's got it all figured out. He will provide the lamb. And I brought a picture of Abraham and Isaac with me today. Can we get that up there? Abraham would have had to bind the hands and feet of his son. He would have had to lift him up and place him on the wood that Isaac had carried, that had been built into an altar. Abraham would have had to lay him out and take out his knife and prepare to place it against the neck of his one and only son. 
to sacrifice, to, to give to God his one and only son. And the question in the moment is, is there a better way? Abraham is stopped by the voice of God. Abraham, don't, don't offer Isaac as a sacrifice. His blood is insufficient. Now I know that you love and fear me, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your one and only son from me. Well, did, did God not know that Abraham loved him up to this point? Of course he did. He's God. He's all-knowing. But who needed to know the condition of his heart? Who needed to know the capacity of his heart? It was Abraham and Isaac. You see, God was acting like a physician who was giving a stress test. The doctor, he generally knows what to expect. He knows your age, he knows your height, your weight, he knows your medical history, he knows whether you do or maybe don't work out. But Abraham needed to know the condition of his heart. Isaac needed to know the condition of his father's heart, of his heart before God. Abraham withdraws his hand from his son, and I imagine he drops the knife. And suddenly behind them, caught in a thicket of thorns, is a ram. And a ram is really an interesting variation of lamb. It's older, it has some horns that would probably really hurt if it decided to ram into you. But this ram has its horns caught in a thicket of thorns. Verse 13, and Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. The ram would be sacrificed. The ram would be offered up as payment for sins. A ram that was wearing a crown of thorns. What does that mean? What does that mean for you and for me? Now, there's, a, there's a church father, a man by the name of Augustine. He had a major impact on Martin Luther many years later. Here's what he says. Who then was symbolized by that ram but Jesus, crowned with Jewish thorns before he was offered in sacrifice? For Abraham and Isaac, God had provided. He had redeemed and given back Abraham his one and only son. And how powerful a moment that must have been. But there would be another who would come. You see, millions of lambs would have their blood poured out and offered, and yet it was not enough to remove the stain of sin, the brokenness of sin. In fact, there's not enough lambs or not enough blood in the entire earth to undo all the damage that sin has done in your life and mine, much less the lives of everyone who has ever lived. And yet one day, one day John the Baptist is is standing on a river bank and he's baptizing and he's preaching and teaching and, and one day as he's talking about the Messiah who was to come, Jesus shows up and here's what he says, John chapter one, verse 29, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is the Lamb the one and only Son of God. God would give his one and only for you and me. Jesus is the one whose blood could atone for sin once and for all. And in the most radical, grace-filled moment in history, Jesus gives up his life for you and for me. There is wood, there were thorns, there was blood that was shed, and yes, there is even death. By his blood, By the blood of Jesus, sin is atoned for, and you are saved. God provides. He provides the true sacrifice. He provides what is needed most, a Messiah, a Savior. Forgiveness, it's not just about overlooking sin or forgetting about it, but rather it's paying the debt of sin. It's paying the debt that that we could not pay. It's paying the debt that, that wrecks lives, that steals our hope. Jesus is the lamb. And as he hung on the cross, he declared, it is finished. It is paid for. It is done. 
By his blood, you are forgiven. By his blood, you have a hope, a promise of eternal life. All because God was willing to give his one and only, the perfect, sinless Lamb of God, Jesus, who is our Savior. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.